Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 57th online Spintronic seminar. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Professor Hans Ru Yang is a Global Foundries Chair Professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, National University of Singapore, uh, working on various magnetic materials and devices for Spintronics applications. He worked at CNS Technology LG Electronics in San Jose and Intelligent Fiber Optic Systems, California. He received his uh, doctor's degree from Stanford University. From 2004 to 2007, he was at IBM Aberdeen Research Center. He has authored more than 220 journal articles, given 200 invited presentations, and holds 20 patents. He was a recipient of the Outstanding Dissertation Award for 2006 from the American Physics Society uh, GMAC sector. He's also a IEEE Magnetic Society Distinguished Lecturer for 2019. Along with all these uh, academic achievements, he's most proud of having a ski instructor license. Uh, so without further ado, Professor Yang, please uh, take it from here. Well, thank you very much, Xin. Uh, thanks for this nice opportunity. You know, because of this pandemic, uh, you know, basically we are trapped, but uh, it's glad to have uh, in this opportunity Talk about uh, non-linear spintronics uh, with uh, topological materials. Um, okay, so this is my content. Huh? So I'll give some uh, in brief background, then move to uh, introduction of bilinear magnetic resistance, uh, in short BMR, in uh, various materials, uh, topological insulator bismuth alanine. Then I'm going to move to two-dimensional electron gas strontium titanium oxide 111 direction. Uh, then uh, tungsten ditalloride. This is uh, one of the typical materials in wire semi-metals. Then I will move to a non-linear planar hole effect with magnetic field and also without magnetic field. Uh, then I will conclude my talk. So as you know, you know, starting from the discovery of GMR enriched our you know, research mostly in uh, magnetic materials. Recently, due to the advance of this uh, spin orbitronics, now the interest moved not only magnetic, but also non-magnetic materials in particular, you know, which can generate uh, spin polarized, uh, you know, carrier uh, population once we inject the, uh, you know, current. So um, we are quite interested in how to combine this, uh, you know, spin polarized band structure materials with non-linear uh, transport. When I talk about nonlinear effect, it means if you apply electric field, there is a, a second order term, which is proportional, you know, to the current basically. So that's the you know additional term. So then um, I'd like to call this is as a nonlinear spintronics. So if we recall, you know, what's the big deal about this nonlinear effect? Probably you know one of the best example is uh, nonlinear optics. So if you look at you know, what's happening in nonlinear optics in our life, uh, we can see many you know, interesting examples um, like generating uh, new colors. Basically, this is connected with the frequency doubling. So if you use this uh, you know, typical green laser pointer, basically you are using a you know, frequency doubling uh, technique. Um, you know, pulsing, uh, spectroscopy, even in telecom sensors, you know, signal processing, uh, is really widely utilized, but not much discussed in the context of uh, spintronics. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So one of you know best material candidate for those um, nonlinear spintronics is uh, non-central symmetric uh, material systems. Uh, one of the typical example how to generate this interesting spin texture, in for example, in the case space, is coming from the surface. You know, for example, uh, 3D topological insulator. We can also create this um, you know, uh, spin population from the interface, uh, such as uh, large bar system, like two-dimensional electron gas. Uh, one of the last examples I want to show is the low-dimensional system, like uh, low symmetry crystals, like a tungsten ditalloride. This is you know, basically one of the prototypical system in uh, wire semi metals so let me move to the, what is the bilinear magnetoelectric resistance, uh, BMR in short. So let me elaborate a little bit more. Um, initially, there was a prediction about this uh, spin momentum locking, 
And once we move up our Fermi you know, energy, then um, this uh, Fermi surface is distorted to the uh, hexagonal warped state. So you can see this, uh, you know, not very circular, but it's like a hexagonal like a state, uh, which is the Fermi surface is, is basically distorted. Um, then if you apply a magnetic field in this system, depending on the magnetic field direction, basically the supported spin and this magnetic field will start to interact, you know, via, you know, G-man energy, probably that's probably easiest way to, you know, visualize. I'm, I'm gonna go back to this, uh, you know, some more details later on. So then whether we can see due to this distorted, you know, Fermi surface, will there be, you know, nonlinear transport effect? So that's one of the main question, you know, uh, we wanted to see in this uh, uh, topological insulated system, namely uh, bismuth selenide. So um, this is a single layer uh, system and device. So we just pattern into the whole bar. Uh, typically we use like a 10 quintuple layer. One quintuple layer is about one nanometer. So 10 to 20 quintuple layer. Uh, also we systematically change those thickness. So once we do a very simple, you know, tail expansion, um, the resistance can be, you know, described uh, current independent resistance. This is a typical resistance when we talk about, you know, DC resistance, we, we refer to those, the first term. Then if you do tail expansion, we have second term, which is proportional to the strength of current. So basically as you inject more current, the value of this resistance will scale. So once we inject uh, sinusoidal you know, current to the system, so then once we do very simple uh, derivation, we can find out basically we have uh, omega term, which is the first harmonic term. And we have this uh, DC rectified term. And then also we have a second omega term. So then if you look at the coefficient of this uh, second Omega term, uh, basically we have uh, you know this non-linear uh, current dependent resistance like R prime uh, zero. So this is what we want to measure. So this is why we have to uh, you know utilize a second harmonic measurement uh, to see this uh, non-linear uh, current dependent uh, resistance. So we carry out those uh, in a whole bar system. We apply magnetic field along the in-plane direction, and then we measure the longitudinal uh, resistance or voltage. Um, if you measure the first harmonic, uh, that is the data is shown in the blue curve, okay? Uh, so this is basically symmetric, uh, you know, when we apply the magnetic field along the 90, that means we apply along the Y direction and 270 degree meaning we are applying the magnetic field along the minus y direction. And you can see it, there is no change, you know, in terms of resistance, we can't really distinguish. So basically this is, uh, uh, you know, current independent term. But if you look at the red one, um, then we apply 90 degree, we get maximum along y direction. But if you apply the magnetic field along the minus y direction, which is 270 degree, we have a minimum. So depending on the magnetic field direction, now we can see very different, uh, you know, uh, nonlinear resistance. So how do we, you know, intuitively understand? Once we apply the charge current along one direction, basically there is a, a supported, uh, you know, spin polarization. So in topological insulator, uh, there is a spin momentum locking property. So once we apply the magnetic field along electrons, basically we will have a maximum resistance. On the other hand, if the magnetic field and supported spin direction is opposite each other, then we will have a minimum uh, resistance. So this uh, basically you know, represent the current dependent, uh, you know, nonlinear transport properties. And basically, you know, it gives the opportunity for us to measure in plane spin texture. We can repeat this measurement along the outer plane, you know, uh, axis. So basically, uh, we can apply in the GY plane. Also, we can apply in a GX plane. So if you look at the GY plane now, 
um, we just need to look at where is the maximum of our two omega signal because that is the direction where the spin is polarized. So you can see the peak happen about 120 degree. So that means um, the spins are tilted about 30 degree from the horizontal plane. So that is uh, expected from the, uh, you know, uh, this hexagonal warp state because we apply the current in this particular device along the K prime direction. Um, also, we can find out, you know, similar information from the other, uh, you know, scan direction. So basically, GY scan will give us information about the outer plane spin texture. In fact, we can repeat this measurement along different crystal, you know, graphic uh, directions by patterning you know, devices in one chip along different directions, then we can map out what are the supported you know, spin canting angle. One interesting observation is uh, no matter which crystalline direction we apply our current, if you look at the XY you know, uh, sweep, we always you know, have a peak at 90 degree. If you look at all this red curve, that means no matter which direction we apply current, the supported spin direction is always perpendicular to the current direction in topological insulator, which is expected. However, the canting angle should change depending on the crystalline you know, direction where we apply the current. So then once we plot those you know, as a function of uh, this angle, we can see nice uh, threefold uh, symmetry and then maximum canting angle is about 30 degrees which is also very similar to uh, you know, Alpes measures. So basically uh, using this um, uh, effect, um, you know, non-linear measurement, we can find out electrical detection of uh, three-dimensional spin texture. This measurement uh, is proportional to current, this uh, you know, uh, two omega uh, resistance. And also as a function of magnetic field also we find linear behavior. So that's why we named as a bilinear uh, magnetoelectric uh, resistance in short uh, BMR. This is quite different from the previous uh, unidirectional you know, uh, magnetic resistance measurement, UMR. In UMR case, you know, we need additional magnetic layer. Then due to the interaction of the saturation you know, uh, state of this magnetic layer and spin polarized electrons, we can see you know, maximum and minimum. So this is kind of similar to like a GMR. like behavior. But in our case, this is a single layer properties. All right, so we worked with our collaborator, um, uh, Shirley and Giovanni uh, did uh, you know, nice uh, theoretical uh, calculation. And then uh, in using the Boltzmann transport, uh, we found uh, there is a good uh, matching between experimental data and uh, theory. And then also confirm this BMR is linked to uh, spin momentum locked uh, you know, uh, surface state with uh, hexagonal warping. All right, so let me go to, you know, what is the physical picture of this uh, BMR in uh, bismuth selenide? If you apply a, you know, certain electric field in topological insulator surface state, basically we shift this you know, Fermi surface into one direction. By doing this, uh, basically we add up certain you know, spin direction in one K vector, but we subtract you know, certain population in upper K vector. So that is basically shown in this F1. Uh, that's the you know, basically distribution function change due to the electric field. However, if you look at the second order effect, this is even function. So you can see, you know, uh, basically one kind of spin, um, there is some addition, but also there is some kind of subtraction effect. But that has a mirror image if you go to the upper GK vector. So basically this can be described like um, the Fermi surface now changed to like a quadruple state. Rather than shifting, actually you squeeze your you know, Fermi surface. Um, so because of this, uh, in second order or in a nonlinear you know, uh, term, basically we have an equal number of electrons carrying opposite spins, but they are moving in opposite directions. 
right? So in terms of you know charge current, we have zero because of cancellation of those you know opposite moving electrons. But in in terms of spin, because they carry opposite spin, we have a pure spin current. So basically, this is one way to generate the pure spin current using you know this uh, nonlinear uh, spin transport. Then we apply magnetic field. So depending on the magnetic field direction, you know whether that support certain spin or it oppose, you know, basically a certain spin direction. So depending on those relationship, you know, we uh, basically you know decide our uh, you know charge current direction. So in one case is um, if the generated this uh, converted the charge current is along you know the same direction basically will have a low resistance if they are in you know, opposite against the initial uh, charge current will have a, a high resistance uh, state so this is basically kind of a physical you know uh, mechanism of uh, you know this uh, bmr effect so let me move you know um, some other measurement using the same uh, physical effect so we carry out in you know, a similar experiment in uh, strontium titanium 111. And uh, if you look at the crystalline arrangement, it's very similar to uh, topological insulator, three-dimensional topological insulator. And then this is a single layer, but we need a certain you know, conduction channel. So we use uh, argon in ion bombardment in a vacuum chamber, then we can generate the oxygen vacancies then this material will be conducting. So you can see at room temperature, uh, you know, um, the resistivity is quite large, but once we cool down, you can see, you know, there are more than two orders change in terms of uh, junction resistance. And we conduct the similar measurement. We rotate magnetic field along the in-plane direction and then measure the second harmonic, uh, you know, measurement. And then we find the nice, uh, this uh, sort of sinusoidal types of behavior and 90 degree indicate when you apply the field along the y direction, we have a peak. That means the supported spin direction is along the y, which is expected from the you know, so-called this Lashiba two-dimensional electron gas uh, system. And uh, this two omega resistance is proportional to the current as well as the uh, magnetic field. So we see basically bilinear you know, magnetoelectric resistance effect. We can also apply, you know, along different uh, uh, planes, you know, in plane and uh, GY, GX, out of planes. And uh, by doing that also we find, if you look at the red data along different crystalline directions, always it has a peak at 90 degree, which indicate the supported direction of spin along the in-plane is always perpendicular to the charge current direction. So that is also expected from you know, typical Lashiba you know, um, theory. However, if you look at now GY scan, basically this one can tell us the, what is the supported outer plane spin direction. You can see the peak happens slightly before 90 degree at certain angle. But here we have almost, you know, the peak happened at almost at 90 degree. But this one, if you look at, is you know more than 90 degree. That means the, the spin is tilted down or direction from the horizontal plane. So we can you know make many devices and then uh, plot the data, and we see nice threefold, basically you know, uh, spin canting, which, which is very similar to that of you know topological insulator. If you look at you know. Just a simple electronic uh, band structure, we have nice, basically six fold symmetry, which was also confirmed you know, by you know, Alpes and band structure calculation, as you can see those. However, if you look at the supported spin direction now, uh, basically you have uh, you know, um, down, up, down, up, down, up types of you know, three fold symmetry along this uh, you know, crystalline direction. And at the same time, we have ordinary Lashiba supported, you know, uh, perpendicular spin momentum locking type. So, you know, uh, in-plane spin configuration. 
Um, so that indicates there is a significant outer plane spin with the threefold rotational symmetry in this uh, strontium titanium oxide 111 surface. And the maximum spin canting angle we found is about 24 degrees. And uh, uh, by you know, having a collaboration with the theorist in uh, Switzerland, we found this outer plane spin is basically a result of a strong cubic crystal field of uh, STO. This material is interesting because STO you know, has a large dielectric constant, then we can apply back gate and manipulate you know, the carrier concentration. So by applying different uh, you know, back gate bias, then we do you know, similar R2 omega measurement. You can see you know, the amplitude is very different. So once we summarize as a function of the gate bias, you can see you know, we can modulate like more than one order of magnitude in terms of this uh, a second uh, harmonic uh, measurement. And then we normalize that as a, you know, basically uh, then plot as a function of temperature. Then we compare, you know, that with, uh, you know, with mobility with temperature. And we see more or less, uh, you know, similar tendency. So then um, we plot this uh, second harmonic uh, signal um, as a function of the carrier density. So basically, by bombarding different amount of argon ion, we can modulate the carrier concentration of this uh, device. Uh, so we made many devices, and then we control the carrier concentration and plot those, and we found there is nice inverse scaling of second harmonic signal as a function of the carrier concentration, and the coefficient is basically you know minus third. Okay, so let me move to you know, another interesting system uh, that is uh, tungsten ditellurite. So this is uh, uh, prototypical materials in the wire semi-metals. And uh, initially 2014, um, Ali reported you know, huge giant magnet resistance, which is, is non-saturating and uh, basically attributed to the uh, you know, compensated uh, electron and hole carrier concentration. Um, then uh, later people found, uh, you know, uh, this uh, evidence of electron hole compensation and also very interesting uh, spin texture. So we pattern, you know, very simple, you know, single layer hole bar and then apply magnetic field in plane rotation. And you can see, you know, again, you know, 90 and 270, we have, you know, peak and deep. So that indicate the supported spin direction is basically perpendicular to the current direction. And this second harmonic signal also scale linearly with current and also magnetic field. So which is a very typical, you know, BMR type of measurement. And the one very interesting observation is as we change the temperature, we found there is a sign reversal. At a low temperature, you know, second harmonic resistance is basically you know, negative, the delta is negative, but then at later at higher temperatures, we found that is positive. So we try to understand and uh, you know, correlate uh, with our whole data. So we measure you know, our conventional ordinary hole, then we extract the carrier concentration and we plot the carrier concentration you know, as a function of temperature. So we found at a low temperature, extremely low temperature, hole and electron they compensate it. So that's how they can get, you know, huge, this large magnetic resistance at low temperature. But as we, you know, move to the room temperature, now the whole concentration is going down. However, the electron concentration is going up and it's mostly electron doped at room temperature. So we interpreted this, you know, as the change of the Fermi level. Okay, so once we shift, you know, this Fermi level from uh, low temperature to high temperature, and then Fermi level shift up, then you can see the electron density is much more than that of Hall at uh, room temperature. And uh, basically this one can be also described, you know, the electron and Hall pocket size change as a function of temperature. So uh, it was also reported, um, you know, by changing at low temperature to high temperature, you can see the electron pocket, you know, grows, however, the whole pocket, you know, sort of shrink, uh, align with our uh, observation. 
So we try to understand, uh, you know, how to interpret this uh, sign reversal. Then we had a collaboration with uh, Chong Han and, and uh, Vita, and then they did the, the second order, you know, um, conductivity calculation, and then also they find as we change the Fermi energy to low to high, there is a uh, sign reversal, and there is a you know strong correlation with the uh, Fermi. Uh, basically in you know, a convexity we call. So you can see if you cut this uh, Fermi surface at uh, zero energy at uh, you know, zero uh, milli EV Fermi level and also at the higher uh, Fermi level, also if you cut at zero energy, you can see um, the, the shape change from you know, like a uh, concave and the convex type of you know, transition. And uh, if you calculate the effective mass at this particular point, actually you can see a negative effective mass because you know the Fermi surface is sort of distorted to inward. So uh, we interpret that this is one of the reason why we can see this uh, sign reversal. And also using a simulation, we were able to uh, sort of mimic our experimental observation. So if you look at this, uh, you know, we can see a sign change and also that highly depending on the, you know, crystalline direction. So once we inject the current along the A crystalline symmetry or B crystalline symmetry direction, uh, we can see very different behavior. And uh, that is very similar to what we measure experimentally in, in this data. All right. So let me move to uh, now, you know, whole geometry. Now you can naively think about, you know, so far we measured all longitudinal geometry. What happened, you know, once we measure the whole geometry, you know, would we see any signal? Yes. So we measure this also as a function of angular dependence. Now we see a peak at uh, 180 degree and uh, both, you know, the current dependent and then the magnetic field dependent, you know, gave us uh, linear uh, dependence. So basically it's very similar to uh, bilinear magnetic resistance. However, if you look at this angular dependence, now there is a shift of 90 degree. So uh, theoretically, Shulei and Giovanni did a good job and then uh, they found uh, uh, low XX, that is basically the longitudinal resistance. But if you look at the whole, you know, configuration, there should be 90 degree offset by using this Hamiltonian. And uh, experimentally, once we measure at the same time, longitudinal and whole, so if you look at this uh, you know, blue one, that is a BMR, we measure longitudinal signal. But if you look at the red one, that is the whole signal, and you can see the exact uh, you know, 90 degree shift. And how do we understand uh, you know, uh, this behavior? Uh, so I'm gonna show you some kind of unified, uh, you know, our picture of uh, nonlinear transport. So as I mentioned, the Fermi, you know, surface distortion, you know, really depends on whether we talk about, you know, the first order or second order. First order is odd function. We shift Fermi surface into one specific direction depending on the E field. However, if you look at the second order, you can see, you know, it's a quadruple you squeeze into one direction. And then, you know, in, for example, in X direction, you expand in both X and minus X. So that's why we call this quadruple. Then, you know, you generate um, spin current uh, in longitudinal direction because we, we squeezed uh, and then it expanded in X and minus X at the same time. Uh, with the opposite spin. So that's why we have a pure spin, but also we squeeze now in Y direction. So we will have a transverse pure spin current along the Y direction basically. So that is what is shown. Then we apply magnetic field to break the symmetry. So let's say we apply the magnetic field perpendicular to the charge current direction. Then what happens? This one will interact with this up spin or down spin. And then only one particular guy will be you know, more promoted. So that's why now we will have an imbalance in terms of spin up and down. So we will have basically you know, 
pure, you no, know, we will have a charge current conversion. Okay, so that will give us this uh, longitudinal magnetic resistance. But now in the whole geometry from this uh, transverse spin current, now we have to apply magnetic field along the you know, charge current direction because then this magnetic field will be either parallel or anti-parallel to this uh, you know, transverse spin current. Then depending on whether they are parallel or anti-parallel, basically you know, we promote one particular one spin direction, then there will be a now net charge current because of you know, imbalance of these uh, uh, spins. So basically we will modulate now transverse, um, you know, uh, nonlinear resistance by doing this. So this is basically uh, our, you know, a unified picture of, of uh, you know, nonlinear uh, transport along the longitudinal and also transverse direction. We try to measure, you know, this effect from uh, various materials, uh, bismuth selenide, there's TI, strontium titanium oxide, this is Lashiba system and uh, y semi metal tungsten dithalorite along A and B direction. So we try to be fair by normalize, you know, its uh, uh, device sort of property resistivity and aspect ratio and film thickness and so on. And uh, this is our, you know, basically, kind of, you know, figure of merit number. And you can see uh, bismuth selenide sort of give the, you know, smallest, um, this nonlinear hole resistance. And, but uh, strontium titanium oxide is, is, you know, the carrier concentration is huge. So uh, it gives uh, a quite large number. And the uh, something that selenide, you know, uh, gave uh, reasonable in both directions. So uh, we found basically, you know, there is a strong uh, trend matching with the you know, high carrier mobility and also uh, low crystalline symmetry is uh, key for this nonlinear magneto transport. So then the next question is so far, we, you know, in show a very interesting nonlinear transport with magnetic field. So we, had to apply magnetic field. But if you want to think about, you know, some real application always is preferred not to have any uh, magnetic field. So then we can envision, you know, some interesting applications. So this shows, uh, um, I just repeat in the whole geometry, you know, what is the, you know, basically simple tail expansion, then you can have the first term is uh, uh, basically, um, you know, current independent hole resistance there's omega term. Then the second term is rectified you know, DC term. If we use, utilize this rectified DC term, basically we can you know, have energy harvesting. So there is some kind of you know, omega signal is coming at any frequency. Then if you convert to the DC term, basically that's what you know, we refer to as uh, you know, energy harvesting. Last term is, you know, as we described so far, that is the second harmonic you know, term. So, Again, this will give us a frequency doubling. You know, you can imagine this, our green laser point. Um, theoretically in 2015, this was predicted uh, by a few, you know, uh, different uh, research groups. Uh, if there is a very curvature dipole, BCD, uh, you can have a non-linear hole effect. Namely, you will have this, uh, um, you know, uh, Hole effect, non-linear hole effect without any magnetic field, all right? So please distinguish this non-linear hole effect from the previous non-linear planar hole effect I showed. That is uh, with magnetic field. This theory was confirmed in uh, 2019 by two uh, different groups. Uh, both used uh, tungsten dithaloride and showed uh, this sort of, you know, um, quadratic behavior of the voltage as a function of current, which is expected in the nonlinear hole effect. And uh, both, you know, basically described due to a uh, very curvature dipole. Unfortunately, the observation, you know, was made only up to 100 Kelvin. The maximum temperature they could see somehow in the paper, you know, is up to 100 Kelvin. So basically for real application, we need a room temperature detection. So we um, utilize uh, different materials, uh, tantalium iridium TE4. 
this material is known as some kind of a hydrogen atom example in wild semi-metals because uh, it has the minimum number of you know, wild point and node, uh, its smallest number. So it's a kind of simplest example in terms of uh, you know, uh, type two wild semi-metals. If you look at the atomic arrangement, you can see along the A direction and B direction uh, is uh, very different. And if you apply the current along the A direction, you can see the left and right side, you know, symmetry is broken. So uh, we expect, uh, you know, some interesting uh, behavior, uh, which basically will give us the very curvature dipole. So we measure in uh, various, uh, you know, whole devices as a function of temperature and apply the curve. You can see voltage is quadratically scaling. So that means, you know, uh, the nonlinear resistance is scaling with the current. And then uh, luckily we were able to see our clear signal even up to room temperature. You can see that one. And also there is a, you know, sign conversion. So I'm not gonna go too much details about uh, you know, the detail, um, and uh, basically once we see uh, this room temperature effect, that means uh, we can use this. And if there is any room temperature effect, basically we expect exactly same amount of this effect. As you can see in this, you know, the coefficient of the second term and third term is equal magnitude. So we expect, you know, DC term should be, you know, similar magnitude as the second harmonic, you know, term. So uh, basically we shine uh, Wi-Fi types of, you know, uh, wireless signal using antenna outside. Uh, so this is not, you know, connected measurement. So we shine around 2 point, you know, like 4, 2.34 gigahertz uh, Wi-Fi. Signal and just it is basically electrified transfers the voltage. So it's a DC voltage. And as you can see, when we apply um, the electric field along the A direction and we measure the voltage along the B direction, we see you know, basically maximum signal. In other geometry, you know, we see very small uh, or negligible signal. So attribute this is due to a high carrier density at the Fermi energy. This material has about 10 times higher carrier density compared to tungsten dihydride. So the resistivity is also very small and you know, conductivity is higher. So we believe that is the reason why we can see room temperature, uh, nonlinear hot effect. And also we showed the wireless RF electrification at zero, uh, you know, uh, external bias, also zero magnetic field. Uh, even though the uh, the BCD is interesting, uh, searching for other you know mechanism is also interesting. Whether we can generate still uh, this non-linear hole effect without magnetic field. So we go back to our you know usual material, this bismuth selenide, and uh, look at you know try to look at the response at zero magnetic field and measure this non-linear hole measurement. Then we found wow, <laughs> there is you know nice. Uh, non-linear hole effect at zero magnetic field, which is uh, scaling with the current, as you can see, and also we can see even you know up to you know room temperature. This material, due to the C you know three B symmetry, the very curvature dipole should be zero. So there is no you know uh, very curvature dipole effect. So then we, you know, try to look at what would be possible explanation of this uh, behavior. Then we attributed, you know, skew scattering, you know, could be the uh, possible origin of this observed nonlinear hole effect. And this is the first demonstration of the basically extrinsic uh, nonlinear hole effect, except an other than uh, BCD. All right. So let me quickly summarize what I've shown. Uh, basically, we show, you know, spin-dependent nonlinear magnetic resistance. Uh, in short, the BMR uh, can be utilized to prove uh, 3D spin texture in a non-central symmetric materials. Also, there is corresponding spin-dependent non-linear hole effect in a wild, you know, wild class of uh, uh, you know, non-magnetic materials. And also, in addition to the spin texture, the effect of the Fermi surface shape 
you know, also you know, provide a very important role on the nonlinear magnetotransport. And finally, nonlinear whole effect can exist on you know, energy harvesting, such as DC electrification, also you know, frequency doubling uh, applications. So for this, I want to thank uh, you know, many of uh, collaborators who mostly you know, supported the theoretical and uh, you know, simulation uh, support. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Panha and Dr. Dusha Kuma, who collected all this, you know, most of the interesting data, as well as many, you know, other group members who contributed. All right. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the exciting talk. Um, so this talk is open for questions. Uh, if you are on Zoom, you can use raise hand uh, function, or if you prefer, you can send me a private message and I can read it for you. And if you're joining us on Twitch, you can type your question in the chat box. And I, then I can also read it for you. Do we have any question? So I can ask a question. Uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, uh, okay, Emma, uh, go ahead, yeah. please. Uh, how would you differentiate any thermal effect? Uh, when I see this I square, I always think this thermal nurse effect stuff can contribute such measurements. Let's see. Maybe I missed Somebody the some symmetry arguments. Mm -hmm. I can distinguish. Uh, maybe I share different one. So this is the measurement uh, we try to confirm whether we can really see um, this uh, second omega measurement. So we repeat our measurement using uh, basically uh, DC uh, plus uh, you know, only DC measurements, for example. So if you look at that uh, DC at zero, we can see this nice, you know, uh, typical, um, you know, change with this uh, in-plane angle. Then we apply uh, the current along the positive and negative. So basically, you know, this will give us the, uh, the change yeah, depending on the DC current. So if you look at this, basically the baseline change. So we attribute uh, the baseline change is due to the heating effect. But basically that should be, you know, symmetric. I mean, it, it doesn't there is no reason why, you know, when you have a 90 degree versus, you know, 270 degree, there should be, you know, different heating. Um, but if you subtract those, uh, you know, two uh, data, uh, minus two and uh, two, then you can see, you know, nice uh, sort of sinusoidal, you know, delta R, which also change yeah, depending on the current direction. So uh, indeed, I mean, any electrical measurement is uh, unavoidable to have a heating effect, but um, if you look at the symmetry, you know, obviously the spin dependent property uh, will not have, you know, uh, this angular dependence due to heating. Uh, Dr. Patton, please go ahead with your question. Sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, as some of you know, I've been involved in nonlinear microwave magnetic work for a long time. <clears throat> and uh, that's kind of why I wanted to hear your talk. And uh, I'm not, I don't know much even about linear transport properties, but uh, in microwave magnetics, the, the uh, 
two omega response is related to the ellipticity of the magnetization precession because the Z component wobbles at twice the precession frequency. Uh, and this leads to a whole host of applications for uh, signal to noise enhancers, uh, mm. limiters, filters. Uh, in fact, much of the basis of microwave magnetic devices is based on these nonlinear interactions. And uh, again, I'm not an expert even on the on the linear part of this, but uh, do any of any of these uh, uh, high power electrical properties, you know, you started out with a Taylor expansion, which uh, we can also do, but normally we tie it into the dynamics. Uh, can, this, can this lead to practical devices of any kind? And uh, what's the physical basis? <laughs> what's the physical basis for all of these things uh, in a few, in 25 words or less? <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually, I initially had the same, you know, uh, thinking because uh, I'm also aware of this uh, high power, you know, like a, you know, non saturation observer. I mean, there are many uh, applications using. Uh, right now, for example, in in our energy harvesting application, we try to optimize the living antenna. Right now, we have a huge mismatch of uh, you know impedance, so we lose a lot of energy. So we try to match those and then try to see how much we can, you know, collect uh, energy efficiency and compare with that of the commercialized version, which is uh, Shockey barrier based, you know, um, energy harvesting applications. So that, that's one thing we are, you know, right now, it's quite early, you know, um, not many people really explore non Linear, you know, physics in spintronics, even though it's very widely explored in, as you mentioned, in the you know microwave application, optics application, and so on. Right. So I think in the community we should pay some more attention and you know try to explore what would be you know, possible application out of this physics. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for excellent you know input and. Uh, Okay, do we have other question here? Let's see, let me just quickly check on Twitch. Uh, there's a one question on Twitch. Let me just read it to you. Uh, great talk. In your basement selenide nonlinear planar Hall effect experiment, were all the contacts tunneling through the MGO aluminum capping layer? Um, so basically, we punch through this uh, capping layer when we do wire bonding. So that is basically protecting the interface. It's very thin. So when you make a wire bonding, basically you punch it through, you know, a few nanometer oxide. So basically, there is no tunneling. We have a direct contact to the uh, to the surface of bismuth cell. Okay. All right. Do we have other question on uh, Zoom? Oh, there's quite a few actually. Raise uh, uh, their hand, so maybe yes. um, I can uh, see. Let me, uh, Kirill, do you want to ask the first question? Yes, uh, thanks for a very nice talk. So I have a question about the uh, uh, mechanism by which the magnetic field um, affects the, the, the resistance. So I, I have a picture in my mind and I, I want to tell me if that's correct or not. So my understanding is, um, if you have an electron pocket, let's say, um, with a certain spin texture, then when you apply the magnetic field, then uh, in the regions of the Fermi surface where the field is parallel to the spin, uh, the energy of the electronic state is going to um, go up because the magnetic moment is anti-parallel to, uh, to the spin. Yeah then those states will be raised up. So if those are electrons, the pocket will shrink in that area. So the, um, the conductivity should go down. And if the field is anti-parallel in the given region, then it will shift um, in the opposite direction. So you'll have an opposite effect. 
so this explains why the sign of the effect de depends on whether you have a um, hole-like region or an electron region, and they have a sign change. So I think one possible, you know, way to uh, understand uh, my my way is even simpler. I just look at like a GMR. No? So when your magnetic field is, you know, along the, uh, you know, with the. But GMR requires uh, scattering in two different regions. With, That's uh, right. So my my point is, you know, very simple way. Huh? Is whether it's a parallel or anti-parallel, <laughs> without the detail, you know, uh, mechanism. Right. I, I think your picture is yeah one way to you know understand this. Yeah, but it, it's 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 very different. In one case, it's it's controlled by scattering. But in this mm -hmm. case, it's just the uh, um, the carrier density, basically. Mm, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Ajit Hussein, please uh, go ahead with a question. Yeah. So thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, so I have very basic questions. Uh, one uh, first question is a. Uh, uh, so how uh, how did you control this oxygen vacancy creation? Uh, so you protect this titanium and uh, strontium when you split with the argon. Mm. Uh, so how did you do that? So well, basically, what you can do is you just change your you know argon density, argon plasma density, and uh, by you know tuning the RF power. Uh, uh, so, so there was no uh, titanium and strontium vacancy over there. It, it was controlled. Um, that we don't know, you know, what will be strontium vacancy, but we know, you know, by doing that, uh, uh, you can control the oxygen vacancy because that will mainly determine your conductivity of these particular materials. And this method uh, was established by, you know, the oxide community uh, previously. So we, we adopt, you know, those techniques. And using our, uh, we 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 didn't create this method. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. And did you see any thickness dependency in uh, your last work that uh, with the two uh, D material? That's uh, that's right. <laughs> I'm not sure whether I included uh, those <laughs> thickness data here. Let me check quickly. Uh, Maybe not here. And I can open take this one, for example. So for example, if you look at uh, here, so we also studied uh, this uh, second harmonic you know data as a function of uh, film thickness. And uh, we found so is the thinnest right. one will give the maximum, you know, largest signal. So basically, uh, the signal is coming from the interface, uh, including, you know, the TI, also these wire semi mirrors. So this is basically right. interface effect. But it is a thickness dependent. So how it is interface? Mm, can you repeat the question? But there is a thickness dependency. So it is a bulk effect, I guess. No, this one is basically you see a strong signal at the thinner film. So that okay. is basically saying it's interface effect. Okay, maybe I'm confusing. Uh, okay, so so th this is, is basically that, that your band structure, uh, uh, your, your, your hexagonal band structure changes with the thickness to saying that. That's right, in, in, the, in the bulk, you know, it's, um, Basically, it's very close to you know central symmetric, so mm -hmm. um, that cannot generate uh, this uh, second harmonic signal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, Yang Wang, please uh, go ahead with a question. Um, Professor Yang, thank you for your nice talk. Uh, in a business seminar, the contributions from top and bottom surfaces are opposite. Uh, the non reciprocal uh, responses are observable because uh, the, typically the top surface is dominating. Uh, is there a way that we can control the quality or property of the bottom surface so that the, uh, the, the response, the net response is enhanced or suppressed? 
This is a very good question. And uh, in fact, many people naively think uh, top interface would contribute more than bottom interface. But actually, as some experiment we found, uh, bottom interface may dominate the transport. And uh, recently, I read a paper from uh, Professor Kang Wang Group in UCLA, and also they attributed uh, uh, from their measurement in some topological uh, you know, devices, they find the bottom interface sometimes you know, dominate the transport. So I think this is still an outstanding question. And this is why sometimes when you read other groups report in topological you know, material system, their sign is different from other group. I believe uh, this, uh, you know, the major contribution sometimes the top or, or bottom because with the upper design in which dominate the most, probably this complicate the situation and then, you know, make it very messy in terms of, you know, design. Um, and uh, still, uh, you know, I think uh, we need more, you know, research to understand uh, this behavior. I think it's an outstanding question in the community. Oh, uh, I have another question uh, here. Uh, the effects are observed in Bismuth sand, which is heavily doped. Mm, did you uh, observe similar B BMR and nonlinear planar for effects in other GIs? In other uh, topological insulators, which have a lower uh, chemical potential? Um, I'm I'm sure. Yeah, as long as you have, uh, you know, the basically. Um, speed momentum locking and uh, topological surface state, you, you will have this effect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Hansu, do you still have the, the, uh, the bandwidth to take more questions? Yeah, sure, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so even though it's uh, past uh, almost midnight at uh, uh, Singapore, uh, Professor Yang still uh, are going to stay for a little bit longer for another informal discussion. But at this moment, I want to thank the speaker and thank you all of you for participating.